leave of camera is on. Good morning. I'm Pastor Bill. If you're tuned in, this is Thrive Worship Center in Vienna, West Virginia. If you want to find a Bible, um, we are in the fifth chapter of Matthew in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is the longest sermon that Jesus gave in his brief three years of, of ministry here on earth. And um, it is filled with beautiful wisdom. And I, I want to say something to you, friend, if you are watching by uh, Facebook or YouTube right now. You don't have to be a Christian to be blessed by the Sermon on the Mount. You know, I pray that by the end of this message, or or perhaps soon, that you will give your life to Jesus, because he gave his life to you. Um, this is a historical fact. You, you, you watch me on the camera, or I doubt anybody in this room is listening to me in, in a skeptical way, but I hope not, but... If you're watching on this camera, this YouTube channel, this man named Jesus was born 2,000 years ago in approximately A.D. 6. And he lived in a place called Galilee. And he was the son of a carpenter. This is a historical fact. It's, it's not a fairy tale. It's a fact, and and when he was when he was I guess around thirty years old, I think he was thirty years old. He began the work of the work that his father in heaven called him, sent him here to do. And it wasn't just about miracles and teaching; it was about redemption. It was about giving his life, God. Almighty God, uh, the one that you might be mad at today, seeing what has God done for me, why are there suffering people, and wherever you, you may be mad at God today, yes, that God, that God who existed, you know he exists, you know he does, you, you can't sit there and say that he doesn't, because you know that he does, the Bible says that God put eternity into our hearts, that's right, and it's that God that came in the form of not a not a, a, a victorious king, but a servant. And after three years, he was taken to a place called Golgotha in, in Jerusalem, which at once was at one time was Mount Moriah, where Abraham. You heard the story when you were a kid, right? Abraham was told to sacrifice his son, but he was stopped just in the nick of time, right there at that spot. That's where Jesus, he was crucified on a Roman cross. This is history. If you don't believe the Bible, look up a man named Flavius Josephus. Look up a man named Pliny the Younger. Uh, look up, uh, or the, yeah, you, I think it's Pliny the Younger, Pliny the Little or something. Look, look read history. It happened. It happened. Why? Why did Jesus allow the Romans to put him on a cross so that you would be blessed by what I'm about to read? You see, if if you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He rose from the dead, <coughs> what I'm going to read to you it may be pretty, it may be good advice, but it won't change your life. Because in order for that to happen, you must get on your knees and, and call out to a great God and say, God, please, I want to know this. I want to know Jesus. God is a gentleman. He doesn't bang down doors. He doesn't. And so as we read this this morning, in the remaining time we have, <laughs> in the remaining time we have, just listen. And then when we're done, when we're done, ask God to fill your heart with his, with his spirit. And then um, come visit us or maybe 
see the church across the street from you or across town. But anyway, thanks for letting me uh, talk for a minute there. All right, everybody. So, hello. How are you? Good. 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 Yay. Smile. Everybody smile. There we go. Smiling is good. That's right. I know some of us have trouble smiling sometimes, but this was put on my stand. I, I think I did it. This is a brochure for the, the recovery ministry school, and these are back over there. This will tell you all about it. Now, I'm not expecting, well, if you want to come, you can. It meets on Monday at 4.30, but I would like you to please maybe put one of these in your car. We're looking for more students. We have a vision here. We're building an army. We're building an army. It's my hope and my prayer that a few years from now that the School of Ministry, Recovery Ministry, there's so many people, we have to do it down here. And then maybe a year or two later, there's so many people, we have to do it over there. Amen. David Jeremiah once said, they won't come, they must be brought. They won't seek, they must be sought. And they won't learn, they must be taught. Amen. And the Lord wants us to teach people. And you know what? If you learn a verse in the Bible, I'm going to preach today. I don't know if I'm going to get to the <laughs> message. If you learn a, a verse in the Bible, the, any verse you want, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believed in him will not perish, have eternal life, then you can teach. Just teach that. You say, I only know one verse, Jesus wept. Then teach that. <laughs> and, then, and then from Monday to Friday, Memorize another verse. When you see your friend again, you teach him that verse. And this week after week. Yeah? It's, and you, yeah. All right. So Matthew 25, or Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 25. I'm Matthew 5. I don't know. It's not like Joe Biden, though. I, I do Bill Clinton, too, if anybody would like to. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Okay, here we go. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 30, 43. Verse 43. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Means. No, enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, that's plural, and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now, why did Jesus say this? Why was he teaching this? Because the, the, the Jews at the time of Jesus, they very few of them spoke Hebrew. The, the, the language of Hebrew wasn't reinstated in Israel until the 20th century. Somebody, I forget what his name was, but he went on a campaign to get the Jews to be able to read and write and speak Hebrew. And they lost it because they went to Babylon for 70 years. And so the older generation that were in Babylon, they died off. And the younger ones, as they came up, they were taught Aramaic, kind of a Babylonian Aramaic language. Did you know that Jesus spoke Aramaic? Yes. And so Hebrew was a forgotten language, except for those that were very well educated. The, the wealthy, they, they spoke, they wrote, and they, they could read Hebrew. They were, they were called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the, sad, the Sadducees were always sort of grumpy. They were sad. You see? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the <laughs> so they didn't know Hebrew. And so guess what these guys are doing? By the time of Christ, the Pharisees, they were, they were uh, 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 self-righteous, most of them. Not all of them, but 
most of them. They were very self-righteous, and they changed, they changed what the Old Testament taught. They taught the, 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 their brothers and sisters uh, in Judaism to hate, their, to hate the enemy. Love your neighbor, your fellow Jew, but hate your enemy. And Jesus, that's why Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, but it wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. If you look at Leviticus chapter 19, I'll be able to kind of drive that, um, that point home here. In Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. In other words, love your people. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Hmm. But they weren't teaching that. And so what it did is it caused the people, let me go back to Matthew, it caused the people to hate the Romans and to hate the Samaritans. Samara, yeah, Samaritans. And, and, and Jesus was trying to show them that that was not the case at all. As a matter of fact, you'll be surprised to know that there is no place anywhere in the Mosaic Law that tells the children of Israel to hate their enemies. So, what happens here? They look at things like psalms that David wrote. Turn to Psalm 139 in your Bible, please. Look over to Psalm 139. You have? Every well, come up here and share it with us, sister. I have read it every day. Well, come on. You want to come read it? I was just reading it right now, too. Yeah. Um, where is it? Is it all over? Psalm 139, verse 21, to be specific. You can read my iPad, sure. I got the one. Right you got one? Well, Cla this is class participation. The whole thing. Uh -huh. The whole thing. No, no. Start at verse 21 and read verse 21 and verse 22. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way of rest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sherry. It's your pastor Bill. I ask for that every day. Huh? I ask for that every day. Amen. Bless you for that. You said to me, Pastor Bill, you said it doesn't say anywhere to hate my enemies. It says it right there. It's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> now, wait a minute. All right, now. There are a couple of places in the book of Psalms. They're called the precatory Psalms. Siri, what does precatory mean? King David is, is mad at the people. They are they're 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 rebelling against God. And he's he's very disturbed about it. And he's he's talking to God and, and he's he's saying, God, I, I hate this. These people are blaspheming you. They are they're rebelling <coughs> against you. They're setting up the Asher poles and they're and they're and they're and they're doing evil things. And David is saying to hate your enemy. He's saying that he hates the fact that people are are not worshiping God. That word is imprecatory, by the way. You might want to look it up later on. If we look at Psalm 58, we'll discover the exact same thing. I want to read that to you, too. And stay with me now, particularly if you're watching from home, because this all comes to a point in a few minutes. Amen. In Psalm 58, in verse 3, it says that, that the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth. They speak lies. And jumping down to verse 6, David writes, he says, Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. 
tear out the fangs of the young lion, Lord? Whoa! Are you kidding? Doesn't sound to me like David loves these people. Let them vanish like water that runs away when he when he aims his arrows. Let them be blunted. Let them be like a snail that dissolves into slime. Oh my gosh, when you were a little kid, did you ever pour salt on a snail? Right? You say to me, Pastor, well, what the heck? What are you, what, what, what's the deal? David wasn't praying a personal prayer against these people. What he was doing is he was praying a judicial prayer because the people were against God. And so by the time the, of Jesus, the Jews were being taught to hate anyone who wasn't a Jew. And it was widespread throughout the Jewish community. As a matter of fact, they went so far as to call a Gentile, and a Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. They called them dogs. You Gentile dog. <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? Jesus is like, oh man, how can this be? How can you people, you Jewish leaders do this? And we see this account very clearly in the, the, the story that Jesus tells of the, the good Samaritan, right? The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Assyrian. In 722, I think, B.C., yeah, right around in there, the Assyrians came down and they conquered the northern kingdom, Israel. And instead of taking them all back to Assyria, uh, Mesopotamia, you know, all that land of the Chaldees and all that routine, they stayed there and they integrated into that culture. They took over the land. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, on the other hand, was smart. I'm, you know, saying we got to really love Nebuchadnezzar, but the guy was smart. He took all the Jews in, back to Babylon and he turned them into Babylonians. And he, he, he well, that's a sermon for another time. Okay, so when we get to the book of Daniel. Okay, so the Samaritans and the Assyrians came together and they married and so forth and so on and they made Samaritans and the Jews hated them. They called them dogs. Samaritan dog. And so this 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 uh, guy is walking uh, down from Jerusalem one day and he gets attacked by robbers and they beat him near to death and they steal his horse and, and they leave him on the side of the road and and along comes uh, a rabbi. Oh, I get the phylactery out of this word. Oh. You know, and, and, and he looks at the guy on the road and he just keeps going. You ever done that? You pull up to a stoplight and there's a lady sitting there on the ground and she's got her little kid with her and she's got a sign, please help me. You don't have to give them money, but, but don't do what I used to do and say, you lazy jerk, get up off your butt and get to work. You guys know your pastor is a sinner. Don't, please don't ever, ever put me on a pedestal because then you'll have to knock me off. Okay? Did you do that ever? You, you jerk, get to work. You sitting there stealing money from people. You have no idea. You have no idea who beat that person up and robbed them and threw them in the, threw them in the ditch. A uh, priest comes by. The priest was first, then the rabbi, the guy with the thing on his forehead and the tassels on it. He looks down there and just keeps going. And then along comes a Samaritan on his donkey, and he's going. He's on the same journey. Remember, a Samaritan is a dog. You Gentile dog. He stops, gets off his horse. He goes to the man lying in the ditch. He he helps him. He gives him water. He dresses his wounds. He even puts the guy on his donkey. And he takes him halfway between uh, 
of Jerusalem and wherever it was they were going, and there was an inn. And he takes him there and he drops him off. He puts him in a room. He goes and he gets him food and water. He goes to the innkeeper and says, just take care of this guy. I'm going to finish my journey. I'm going to come back and I will pay you. It's very important also that we don't misinterpret what Jesus is saying about loving your enemies. Okay? Say we're going to be better. Jesus is not saying that we are to love sin. We should hate sin. Make sure you don't misinterpret that. Jesus hated sin. In our life, in the lives of others, if you have a friend who's a fellow Christian and you and that you love them, they're your friend, and they're in they're in a unrepentant sin, meaning that they do it over and over and over and over again, and it's ruining their life. It's just like they, Jesus hates divorce because it destroys families. Sin destroys families, literally. I, I know that firsthand. It does, and. Jesus hates that. When Jesus went to uh, the temple in Capernaum, not Capernaum, <laughs> but remember that Sherry? <laughs> we got the whole class got this debate one day whether it's not Capernaum, it's Capernaum. <laughs> Capernaum, Capernaum. When I, I I was dating Michelle, and she said, why don't you drive down to Huntington, you can take the, the river route, whatever it is, and I said, you mean I can go through Galapolis? <laughs> she said, no, but you can go through Galapolis. <laughs> Galapolis, that's what I thought. Jesus goes down to Capernaum, and he's, I'm gonna get Angie to start laughing here. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> and, they're the, the they're following him. The Pharisees are following him, and the you know and the people and they're watching. He got the Sabbath day, and he comes upon this guy with a withered hand, and they're like, "Well, what are you going to do here?" A lawyer says to him, "Are you going to heal his hand? Is it right? Is it okay to heal a person's hand on the Sabbath?" And Jesus is like, "Ay, Dios mío, suave, ah, oh, come on, people, come on." He heals the man's hand. He said, are you going to let this guy through the, through the rest of his life not being healed? But they didn't get it because they were so wrapped up in tradition and the way things, the, the way the Pharisees said that it has to be. If you're from a background of very traditional um, fundamental Christianity, talking to the camera here for a minute. Listen, that's beautiful. Um, I think that churches with pews and lights and everything, I think they're beautiful. And I think that the hymns are beautiful. I just was never exposed to them. I'm from another, another dimension. <laughs> California. I just was never. They're beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you focus more on the tradition and don't let the love into the room, then it's, it's no longer helpful. Turn to Matthew 23 in your Bibles. I'm going to make sure that we really drive this point home because I think it's so very important. So very important. Go to verse 13 of, of Matthew 23. Amen. Now, Jesus has told them to love your enemies. Whatever you heard, forget it. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. In, in a moment, I'm going to read something to you from Oswald Chambers that I think will uh, help you to 
kind of take a step up on the ladder of grace. I, I hope you're going up the ladder of grace. Um, or at least that you want to. Amen? Because at the end of the day, even before I read this, because this is going to scare you. <laughs> when I read this, you're going to go, oh, God, did Jesus really do that? <laughs> Amen? But Jesus hated sin. He hated hypocrisy. Yes, Jesus <coughs> hated sin. And that's okay. We need to hate sin with everything, every fiber in our being. Because sin is what destroys our life. And it also gives a portal, an entryway, a doorway to Satan, to his demons. Something came to mind. I'm reading a book about Satan right now and, and uh, learning about demons. Um, I think it's the next place that I'm going to go when we finish the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not sure yet, but I'm reading about it. I'm learning about it. And did y'all know that as a Christian, you cannot have a demon in your in, in your body, your soul. Your, you can't be possessed. If you're a Christian, the Spirit of God is in your heart. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead resides within you. I could just go on and on on that. You, you got the power of God. You, there's no demon crawling around in, inside of you. But you have a friend who is uh, not a Christian. If you do, and, and they're, they're inviting you to this and that, and to places you ought not be, to movies that, that you, you, you shouldn't go see. I, I, don't, I don't go to R-rated movies because there's something's going to be in there that's going to stick in my little brain. Top Gun wasn't R-rated, was it? <laughs> um, Probably. No, it wasn't. Actually, back in that day, probably it wasn't. It probably should have been. <laughs> yeah. The first one, probably. Yeah. Um, what happened to Kelly McGillis, anyway? I mean, okay, anyway. Focus, William. <laughs> My wife, William. Focus. Um, you're hanging out with someone that doesn't know the Lord. And they're doing stuff they ought not be doing. You think they got some hanger honors? You think they got some demons around them? What do you think's causing them to do the stuff they're doing? The demons are. They're whispering in their ear. Go ahead and go into that place. Go ahead and buy that. Go ahead and it, it's 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 okay. Your your wife doesn't love you anymore. It's okay to flirt with that secretary, or well, nowadays vice versa. You, look, beloved, don't hang out. I'm, I'm on another topic for a minute. Don't hang out with people that, that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ to the extent that you go and do what they do. Now, it's okay to have friends that do. Matter of fact, I hope you do have friends that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ because maybe you'll rub off on them. But just remember what Dr. Dobson said. If you stick a white glove in mud, the mud will not get glovey. <laughs> Think about that one for a second. Just remember that. Right? And so Jesus hates sin. Does Jesus hate Satan? You ever think about that? I think we better come back to that some other time. Let's read this. But woe to you, Matthew 23, 13. But Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You remember? You can't heal the man. You can't heal that man's hand, his withered hand. It's the Sabbath day. Neither enter yourself nor allow those who would enter to go in. You stop them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you travel across the sea and the land to make a single proselyte. That would be someone that comes to Judaism. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you. Is that what your Bible says? Yeah. 
Holy smokes. Jesus hates sin. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? And so, so, so whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. Verse twenty-three. What? Oh, twenty-six. My iPad rolled up. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear as beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones. That's, I, I, oh boy. Jesus, Jesus really hated sin. And he really didn't care for what these folks were doing. And he's calling them out on it. Y'all, we are not fruit inspectors. We'd be calling out people randomly. You did this, you did that. Don't do that. Pray for that person. In that person's life, there is somebody that loves them and that they trust. And if you are that person, then go to that person and, and don't say you're being this, you're being that. But go to them and say, listen, can I pray for you? I see that there's something going on in your life. And I believe that it's sin. Can I help you? Will you let me pray for you? Now, hopefully they'll receive that. They may or they may not. Amen. What's the point? The point is that the Pharisees were telling them the wrong thing and the people had hatred for the Samaritans and the Gentiles. And we are hearing the same thing today. Nothing has changed. Friends, do you think that John F. Kennedy or LBJ signed in the anti-discrimination laws? you think that changed racism in America? And I would venture to say that without the violence, racism is worse today than it was in 1960. CRT, critical race theory, it's racism. It's, it's Marxism. Read about it. Learn about it. That's exactly what it is. The country is being divided. Don't let the world tell you to hate someone. Love your neighbor even if you don't like them. Love them anyway. Our churches are partially empty because Christians that used to go to church, they won't come to church anymore because they hate so and so. It's actually so stupid. It is so childish. I told a man one time that, that, that uh, wouldn't go to church. He used to go to church. I told him, I said, don't you, don't you want to love your neighbor? Jesus says to love your neighbor. And he said, well, I, I love my neighbor. I said, really? I said, you really want to learn how to love your neighbor? Come to church and sit down next to that old lady that sings of this horrible, sing <laughs> that horrible singing. Sit there. Best, sure you like it. The best place to learn how to love somebody is sitting next to Margaret in the front row with the B.O. It's true. You got to be nice in church. You know, tell me you're like, yeah. You got to. You don't have to be nice to the cash register lady. You don't have to be nice to the server. You don't have to be nice to the guy at CA House Music. You don't have to be nice to the professor at the university. But you come sit down in the front row. You gotta be nice. Let me close this morning with a, a quote from uh, Oswald Chambers, and then we'll go. Bless our day. We we have. I'm right on time here. We have. We have two minutes. All right. Hang on one second. I gotta find it. You guys read Oswald Chambers. 
chambers to my utmost greatest height. And every day. It's amazing, isn't it? A little hard to read. Um, before you read it, if you're not a big into reading, you have to, you'll have to ask the Lord to, to say, okay, but I give me wisdom as I read this. Because I, I, okay. Love is an infinite thing to most of us. We don't know what we mean when we talk about love. Love is the loftiest preference of one person for another. And spiritually, Jesus demands that this so sovereign presence be for himself. Love Jesus. You say, that, no, I've never met Jesus. I, I love him. I, I mean, I, I'm trying. I just don't get it. I've never hugged him. I, how do I love him? I've never looked into his eyes. You men listen to me very closely. Be obedient. That's how I love Jesus. I don't get liver quivers, funny feelings. I say, Lord, I love you. Okay, build and prove it. For me, that's what works for me. The Bible says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will love you. Right? You went, you ladies, you ladies are different than men. Thank God. Oh, yes. <laughs> But you men be obedient. Say, Lord, I love you. Okay. Prove it. Now there might be some men in here that have a different kind of way of loving Jesus, but that's how I do it. Works for me. Amen. It is easy to put Jesus first, but then we must practice the things mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1 to see them work out in our lives. Amen. The first thing God does is forcibly remove any insincerity and pride. Oh, Lord, please no more. It ain't easy, right? You're rolled on the rolling pin of, that's right. You say, this is no fun, God. He says, yeah, but it's good for you. And vanity from my life. And the Holy Spirit reveals to me, this is all Oswald Chamber. To me that God loved me, not because I was lovable, but because I was his, it was his nature to do so. And now he commands me, us, to show the same love to others by saying, love one another as I have loved you. We started this by talking to the camera, and I'll close by talking to the camera. Pardon me. Ow! <laughs> My knee's bad. Jesus loves you. You say, but Pastor Bill, no, he doesn't. Yes, he does. He does love you. There's more grace in your life than you can imagine. You just don't see it because you're focused on the speed bump. As my old boss used to say to me, drive around me. Don't go running over it at 50 miles an hour. Don't focus on the clouds. Focus on the blue sky. Don't focus on the sand trap. Look at the green. I sound like Joel Olstein here, and I guess that's okay. I like Joel. He's got nice hair and nice ties. Listen to me. Stop looking at the mud and look at the clean water. There's more grace in your life than you can imagine. Every day, every day of your life, something happens or multiple things happen that is the grace of God. And you need to identify at, the, at night before you go to sleep or whatever. Just take a moment and go, okay, God, what cool thing happened today? You'll have a whole list. You say, oh, no, but the pickles weren't any good. Stop. Forget all that crap. Focus on the good stuff that God did for you that day. And if there was something painful, say, Jesus, please take that from me. I give it to you. I cast in 1 Peter 5, 7, I cast my cares upon you. You care for me. Here. Take this. The pain in your life. The stuff that makes you suffer. Write it down. Put it in a box. Put a bow on top. Put it on the, your fireplace where that crucifix is hanging. That cross is hanging. Leave it there. Amen? The grace that God has for us is sufficient. 
for today. Amen. If you've never given your life to Christ and you are at home, right where you are, you can. You can. You can actually kneel down and, and ask Jesus into your heart. Say, help me to believe. Give me faith, God. I want to believe. I want to, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And then allow him. Open the door and let him come <coughs> into your life. Now, do me a favor. If you, if you, when you do that, because whoever you are, I believe you will. Call that person that's been bugging you for 10 years to give your life to Jesus and tell them that you've given your life to Christ. Get out there and tell the world, I am a Christian. Don't bottle it up. Tell mom and dad. Tell grandma. Tell your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. Tell them that you've given your life to Christ. And find a church that teaches the Bible. Amen. All right, let's all stand up.